Hello, and greetings from California. My name is Susanne Gensicke. I am the head of antiquities conservation at the J. Paul Getty Museum, and we are located at the Getty Villa Museum here in Los Angeles, home of the Getty's collection of ancient Greek, Roman, and Etruscan art. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Jens Dena to you, who has been my curatorial collaborator on today's topic. Jens. Hello, I'm, my name is Jens Dehner. I'm a curator in the collection of antiquities at the Getty Museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome everybody to today's art break under the title Conserving an Ancient Bronze Horse and Rider. In 2018, we were approached by colleagues from Albania, ex colleagues excavate, excavating in Albania, excuse me, to take on an extraordinary conservation project and devised a plan with the Institute of Archaeology in Albania for whose re, um, generous support we are enormously grateful. And I'll give you a bit of a background of how this came about. So um, as you see in the title image, we are, we're looking at a small statuette uh, made in bronze of a horseman, a uh, horse and a rider. And this was um, found in Albania at a site we call Babunia. It's a small village um, near the Albanian coast, just across Italy. And uh, colleagues of a team that includes the German, Albanian, Romanian international archaeologists have been excavating there for a while. and. Um, on the screen you see on the right you see a view of that settlement hill um, that is uh, near that modern village of Babunia. We don't have an ancient name for this settlement. It is, we believe, a Greek settlement um, that had to do with the fact that Greeks actually um, started, you know, what we call colonies um, in, in an area um, in antiquity known as Illyria, today's Albania, and this um, would have been um, one of those outposts uh, with a, a Greek population and uh, mixed with sort of indigenous populations who live there. So what we see in this photo, you know, the foreground, or sort of, it's an agricultural area, there are fields, and then there's this hill, if you can tell, there's small trees, olive trees there. And this is where it's, it's very close to where the actually excavation trenches are. And in 2018, um, while the team was on their campaign, um, the um, the um, the uh, local uh, people who, who lived there, in, they they found out. They told them the archaeologists that nearby a farmer who has the, his field right on that hill was going to plow his onion field, um, and the archaeologists uh, became you know sort of alerted to this, and they were very interesting to observe. Uh, what was happening because in an archaeological sensitive area like this one uh, surface finds um, that happen during agricultural work uh, are not uncommon so since they were right there they went and um, witnessed the plowing and during that plowing in fact um, a, a number of sort of like you know smoke and sorry broken roof tiles and and sort of like just small um pieces uh, were were found and nothing unusual um but then also uh, this object and if you could please uh, bring in the next image uh and that was this statue of a horse and rider and here's in fact a photograph of this um you know relatively small um work of sculpture um with the soil adhering to it as it was found. And I believe this photo was actually taken uh, by the archaeologists on the very day it came out of the ground. It still sits there on the field and has been secured and has ever since that day has then been um, under the care of the Albanian Archaeological Institute. And then it came to us as a loan later. And um, after we visited, uh, Susanna and I um, went to I I Tirana, met with the colleagues, and discuss the framework um, of this uh, collaboration and of the conservation work. And also we were interested then in uh, presenting um, the object in an exhibition that is currently actually on view at the Getty Villa. Well, from here, next picture, please. 
And um, after 2019, everybody knows what happened. The world shut down and um, for almost two years and we negotiated the loan further. And just before Christmas, like a Christmas gift in December of 2021, the little bronze arrived from Albania here in Los Angeles. Um, we, um, after the holidays, did high resolution photography to document the incoming condition. Documentation is always the first step of conservation. It's like a visit to the doctor's office. It begins with setting up a patient file. And this is a little patient that came to us for treatment. We were worried um, that it might have changed condition over the years of COVID when um, people didn't go to museums, didn't, didn't take care of artifacts. We thought it might have the experience advanced corrosion, but we were very happy to see. It still looked very much the way we saw it um, two years earlier. So it, what you were saying, Susanna, it came to us, you know, right, sort of, you can, you could tell this, this condition, these photographs were taken um, here at the Getty by our photographers, but looked really more or less unchanged from that photo when it was first found. Um, in that field in Albania. Um, so the way you usually set up for treatment in a museum um, here, I mean, that was something different because we had like something that come more or less straight out of the ground, you know, with all this, with, with this, all this soil uh, adhering to it. Um, what kind of, uh, were there extra challenges in that, that you were preparing for? Yes, and, um, and we will, we will discuss this in, in more detail as we go forward. I mean, every conservation project uh, begins with thorough documentation. We try to understand the entire history and, and, and condition of an object, the fragilities and so forth. But with this piece, you know, there we weren't sure what was inside the soil. Was there possibly remnants of gilding of ancient textiles, anything that would provide information about how the piece um, was interred, you know, what, how it was it decorated. So we needed to be very careful um, because um, as we will discuss in the cleaning process, what lies on the surface will be removed and that may um, contain evidence. So it is a little bit like an investigation of a crime site. We can't, we need to turn over every little stone. Um, let's go to the next slide. We did not only do photography, we also did 3D scanning of the object. Um, 3D scanning has become a common tool in museum work. Um, for us, it was important to document um, all the accretions on the surface. You see around the rider, the mane of the horse. Of course, this looks shiny here. It's a resin print of a 3D image file, um, but that preserves for the future where corrosion was located, where the soil was. It allowed us to handle the piece and the curators to take it in their hands and explore it, to work with designers to explore this play because the bronze was so soft and fragile that we, uh, we at the beginning barely dared to handle it. So this was extremely useful. Um, you, were, you were saying this print allowed us to not handle the actual piece. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. The print um, uh, made the piece available to us in, in, in a digital way. Um, we did further examination. As we see in the next slide, we were curious to find out what the metal was. And we worked with scientist Monica Gagno from the Getty Conservation Institute. She used a... Um, common surface analysis technique that provides um, fingerprints of elemental compositions. Of course, it's only the surface um, since this is a corroded metal. Um, we, um, yes, so we, we, we suspected it would be a bronze because it was of green color. We'll discuss later, there were some little wires, little metal pins, which were added to the figure and I, I, I had hope that you know, some of them might be silver. They were not, but um, yes, so we, we got a very basic understanding of the substance of this um, sculpture. So you mentioned this of like composition and uh, you know, if it's a bronze, we expect it to be alloys. And about this question of like, what exactly 
an alloy contains or how it is, what, what, what the exact composition is, why is this important for the conservation work? I mean, it is, a, it, it is important to know, do we have bronze? Is there iron or silver, for example? Um, we are also keenly inter interested in ancient technologies in studying alloy compositions. So we're also doing this for our own curiosity to, to learn more about the ancient technology that allowed to create the piece. Um, and we can take this further in the next slide. Um, we examined the horse further, as I said, it is a little patient in our museum hospital. So we um, conducted x-radiography and it is very similar to medical radiography in a way that it visualizes the bones, you know, the denser structures of an artifact. But for a metal object, we're using x-ray beams at an intensity that would be extremely dangerous for um, living things and human beings. But um, we have a special facility that is very safe. And here you see the radiograph um, of the horse as it was still covered in soil. And we saw some really fantastic details. Our main questions was how was the piece constructed? How was it cast? Was it possibly hollow? Was the horse cast separately from the rider as some scholars had suggested? Um, yeah, so we gained a lot of insights here, Jens. You, um, um, when you when you look at this from the point of view, like how it was cast, sort of we're talking a lot about the technology or the technique, metallurgy, etc. Um, did you? I know, like I've, you know, I've looked at a number of sort of large scale bronzes. They're often cast hollow, and there's um, there's all these things that can go wrong in the foundry. <laughs> And they typically do go wrong. And then you see signs of that and you see how the foundry workers and the the, uh, the metal workers go about repairing those, uh, what we sometimes refer to as flaws. Um, did you observe any of those at this stage already or, or, or no. what was your impression there? We did not, you know, you, um, you see here, Jens, and all, all of you in the audience, you see that this image is very homogeneous. We don't see any real porosities. We did not see patches. We did not see a join. Any Anything that suggested that the horse was cast separately from the rider, we see a tremendous amount of detail here around the horse's snout. It has teeth, a little tongue, hollow nostrils. It has a bite in its snout. Just wonderful. Um, and then also um, for the audience here, what was most important, we saw that the little rider had a short sword um, strapped around his chest. He had a cupped hand um, that was sort of not gripping the mane, but close to the mane. We didn't know what that meant at that point. And around the, 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 the nose of the horse, we see um, there are grooves where a separately made bridle was embedded. Um, and let's just um, have the next image come in, which shows you this is what the piece looked like. So you see how much information the radiograph provides us with. So now began the conservation process. I have in... a question before, oh, before we go. Yeah, into... let's do. You know, yes. you mentioned that pin in the head. Um, yes. That is sort of like a bit the least expected of, of, of those features that we could see in the x-ray. Um, we were wondering, of course, you know, what this was meant for, you know, was it part of the casting process? Was it something to attach to the, to the figure? But it's very substantial. You could, you know, could think of, was it a helmet or was it, was it something, something else, a head? Sometimes these riders, they wear these petasoi, the Greek word for, for the traveler's head. Um, or was it something to, you know, attach the entire figure to, you know, to a larger object? Did you get yes. any? No, we closer? did not. The, the little pin, I mean, even though the piece is corroded, we can see clearly that the, the pin was entered, set into the head. It's almost a centimeter deep. It's 
maybe a millimeter and a half thick. It has a trace of nickel. It's a slightly different alloy, if we can say so, on a corroded bronze. Unfortunately, we do not know its purpose, but maybe we will learn more as we study Comparanda. And now let's let's see what happened to the piece over the last year. In the next image, we um, see um, a, a first during treatment image. Um, we developed a concept of cleaning and discussion with, with the Albanian archaeologists and authorities. And the first task was to remove the loose soil to um, to excavate slowly in situ down to the surface of the bronze cast. But of course, we didn't quite know how fragile the underlying bronze was. We we didn't quite know what the outcome of the treatment was. So it was uh, was a little bit scary and challenging. Um, what did you do with this soil after you removed it? Um, as I went along removing, I, I collected it. I had a, a map of the horse and I, I, I named little jars with horse. <laughs> they're, they're all little small containers and we can um, at some point do more analysis. There, there may be small pieces of charcoal in there, but of course that could be a much later intrusion that may give provide no evidence about the burial of the horse. But we have a lot of, you know, small, interesting, tiny bits of material saved. Um, we... And as you can see in the next slide, also spent a lot of time examining the surface with a digital microscope with Jens and under other members of our team. The beauty of this microscope is that um, we have a large screen and we can all stand around it together and look at exactly the little pin in the head, the fringes of the garment, of the hair. Um, so we spent a lot of time bef before I really dug in, you know, literally dug in on a miniature scale, um, looking at and, and, and photographing, documenting what we saw. Um, the microscope allows us to measure um, small details and it has a beautiful feature, a video capture feature. And I'm, I'm eager to show you in the next slide what the cleaning process looks like. So um, before we start the video, I just want to orient you um, in the small image of horse and rider on the left side of the screen, the red arrow points to the hem of the garment that the rider wears. Um, it's a little fringed, um, it has a fringed bottom, very delicate, beautifully modeled. And if we start the video, you will see um, how I um, slowly uh, became familiar with the surface. That little pointed tool that I'm using is a ice scalpel. It is extremely thin and very sharp, thinner than a human hair. And I very carefully um, loosened up grains of soil and embedded corrosion and then swept them away with a brush. I created different brushes. I cut them you know, sometimes short to make a slightly stiffer uh, sweeping <laughs> tool. And so a uh, bit by bit, I, I slowly um, excavated details of the surface. Um, sometimes I use denatured alcohol as a lubricant. I drop little drops of alcohol on the sand to make it um, break up a little bit because it was very stiff and it was harder than the underlying corroded surface of the bronze. And um, let's go to the next slide where you see some great progress was made. Most of the mud was removed. You see the beautiful little um, sword in its detail. You can see the, the string that secures it. What you can't see, but trust me, um, even the scabbard is decorated with tiny um, cross-hatched lines. Um, so yes, so at this point, most of the dirt had been removed and now it came down to exposing the finer details. But I want to tell you briefly about corrosion. Um, this bronze alloy would have been bright and shiny in ancient times, but metals, non-precious metals are eager to revert back into minerals from which they were smelted. So we were not able to, so the original shiny surface was lost and 
in in the mechanical process, we're going down to what would have been the original decorated surface, but it is now mineralized. It's very soft. It's very um, challenging mechanically. You have to really develop an understanding of the surface. Um, we were happy to verify that there's no aggressive corrosion process and we keep the piece in a dry environment and uh, to um, you know, prevent any further aggressive corrosion. Let's look at the final product. Um, I remember how relieved we were when you removed the soil around the, where we knew the sword was going to come out, that that sword was still attached to the body and not loose. Yes. And of course, we as, as we go down through the soil, we don't know how fragile the underlying parts are. And for example, the arm and the head is much more corroded mm -hmm. than other parts of the horse. Anyway, um, this is the final um, product, the way it looks now. Um, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about the technology of, of the piece, about its manufacture, the materials. We tried to dig deeper and publish our information. And I just want to say also, um, for the benefit of our partners, it was an incredible privilege to work on this object. Yeah, and it was my privilege to be part of that um, process and the uh, to be sort of the archaeologist, art historian um, uh, in that team uh, together with others. Um, what was for me particularly um, thrilling was actually to be there, it is, as you, you described it earlier, as a mini excavation, right? Sort of like you do, a, I mean, the piece is already out of the ground. But then there's all this, um, I mean, literally sort of layers, you know, dirt, and there's, you know, problematic areas of corrosion, and, uh, and how much analysis actually goes on before you even start doing anything to the object itself. I mean, physically, you know, removing something, you know, so, so, so that step, and then the, um, the, uh, the revealing of details and of a surface, and it's like, we learned we are more about this piece basically with every um sort of square millimeter of of of, of surface being being um revealed and we uh, we understood we got to understand it better and better uh, from the beginning there was a sense that yes here it is probably um archaic late archaic we're talking about you know you know 500 bc or something um uh, greek bronze um but as we um, um the face for instance that sort of partly corroded but was very obstructed by the soil when we received the statuette and it became so much more clear and i think uh gives a much better indication for us how to how to date this piece um, i remember we had already prepared text for the exhibition and then in the end um, when uh, when when your work um cleaning it was finished we um, I adjusted the date based on what this face looked like. I dated, we dated it somewhat earlier in consultation with the archaeologists from the field, um, which was um, which was wonderful. Um, so that you, in a way, sort of like you, you're among the first people to lay eye uh, on on this object, which is really, I mean, it needs to be pointed out on a quality level that is uh, makes this um, a significant. Uh, uh, work in the Albanian, you know, cultural heritage, and uh, even more so was that special that we could host it. Not only you know for it to be uh, treated, but also for it, for it to be displayed in the first uh, the first time in uh, in its history um, before it goes back to Albania. Yes, yes, and 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 we were just so surprised. Look at the mane. Look at the lines. Look at how the fringe mirrors the curve of the mane. I mean, it's just a most gorgeous little sculpture. So we can. Um, I want you to pay attention. You see, like how the figure is almost complete, right? So we're looking at the hands are empty, but on the left hand, maybe um, the rider would have held the reins of the horse. In the right hand. Uh, we don't know this looks like outstretched arm maybe there was a another weapon um involved a spear for instance but that that was lost but the figure as a whole is very well preserved you see very rarely there's the horse of the tail is all the way to the tip and these photos don't show it but if you have the chance to to 
to either go into the exhibition, which is open till the end of January at the Getty Villa, or explore other images um, on the Getty's website. You see how beautifully braided that is. But I want to point out that the feet of the horse, all four of them are broken. And um, that was something that made us think about of how was this, how was this figure, what was its function, how was it used, where do we have to envision it being, being displayed, you know, sort of what was its original purpose. Um, if you go to the next images, we looked at a few um, comparanda. Um, one of them, um, the rider on the on, on the on, on the the figure on the right is actually in our own collection uh, and comes from a very similar uh, group of, of horse and rider, only this rider was in fact cast separately and then mounted <laughs> literally, physically, and you know, and all you know, no pun intended, obviously, or pun intended. Um, on a horse that is that is lost and is of a similar era, somewhat earlier, but uh, has a very similar uh, face of this lively expression, a similar garment. Um, he wears no shoes. Uh, so, but on the left, you see a horse from and rider from uh, the the museum um, uh, in Boston, that whose feet are also broken. The horse's feet are also broken the same way. So they would have been somehow. Um, attached to either a plate that could have been cast with together with the horse, um, or maybe it was mounted on some form of a small base, either as a standalone, for instance, as a standalone figure, uh, one could imagine like a votive, an offering to the gods that would have been given um, in a sanctuary. Um, and we, uh, we, we, we know examples of that from, from around the ancient Greek world, but they're, they're um here's here's one of them uh a very similar figure in 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 many respects the rider is nude but what is interesting is also when we look at the surface susanna um you said it was treated in a very different way that we treated the albanian horsemen yes so um it came into the collection of the museum of fine arts more than 100 almost 120 years ago and i suspect it was probably cleaned by with chemicals or electrochemical methods and all the green colored corrosion products were removed. That was the approach at that time because um, people thought all the corrosion needs to be stripped off to make a piece chemically stable. But then small details that are preserved in the corrosion are lost and there's a certain amount of surface pitting. Um, it's very common. We find that in many collections and you know approaches to conservation and treatments evolve uh, not to beat the medical analogy to death, but it's uh, their new their new ethics and their new instruments, their new chemicals, and we constantly refine our skills. And in fifty years, people will look back and probably think what we did now was not the best approach. I mean, things change over time. I want to point out one other um, scenario for how we could envision a small figure like this um, um, to be um, to be mounted or to be displayed in antiquity. If you go to the next image, um, <clears throat> what what we see is a large, um, luxurious bronze crater, this big vessel that has actual sort of like figures um, attached to it, either um, in form of high relief. You know, around the neck of that vessel, you see on the left side of the of the screen is a, is a detail of that vessel on the right. Um, or um, in um, fully in the round, you know, there, there's something you see like there are figures supporting the handles. And then in the middle is a tripod um, that has other animal figures, um, you know, sitting on top. So these are really like fully attached, fully in the round, maybe cast separately and then attached. Um, we don't know either one, you know, is, was it a standalone figure, was it a votive, or was it part of a larger luxury object, a piece of furniture, a tripod like here. Um, further excavations in the area, we hope, will bring further evidence to clarify this, because as of now, we don't have any, archaeologists have any structure, don't have any structure they can point to by saying like, well, you know, this would have been used there because we have you know, there's a shrine or there's like a, there's a, there's a house or there's something where we would expect um, such an objects to have been found and to have been used by the, um, by the original owners. 
Um, I think that Susanna. Yes, I think we've it. come to the end of what um, we were going to discuss and illustrate, and we can now go to questions. And um, let me see. Um, here is a question, a technological question. I, I have to quickly <laughs> weed through them. Do we see attachment points of the sprues? Um, that is a question regarding the casting process. Do we know where the metal was introduced into the mold, where the vents were? No, we do not. Um, the surface is so exquisitely finished. So it would have, after the casting process, been um, worked over uh, burnished, etc. We we did not find any indication. Not to say it's not there. Um, Jens, do you want to take another question? Um, yes. Let me see. Um, ah, here I take this question. One question is um, how did um, you know the photo um, sees the, the horse on the right that we see right now? How did we support it to take this picture? It seems to float there. So we did. You saw earlier we used a stand um, um, doing a, 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 or a small mount uh, with a with a kind of a cradle that holds the belly of the horse and captures the piece in place. Um, and that was. And then we made one specifically or um, for the uh, for the for the uh, for the photography studio um, that obstructed as little as possible. Um, and in that in that image that you see, that mount was edited out. Um, so it was held in place by a mount similar um, that you saw in other pictures. So so it was just um, we in, in this case it was cleaned up. On the photo on the on the left, actually, as you see with the dirt attached, that is just photographed um, shooting down um, towards the towards the um, that's just like the, the background um, before we started conservation. Um, I'll take a question from regarding um, composition of metal. Um, so um, it is a tin bronze um, with a small amount of lead, but this is just based on surface analysis. You know, as 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 I said, the metal changes. This metal was in the ground for two thousand five hundred years, and as as there are chemicals in the soil and moisture, the ions migrate out. And if we're analyzing the surface, we're not really getting the composition of, of the true alloy. We will remove a sample at the end of the exhibition from the breakages of the legs to um, to, to get a more detailed analysis. We, pe people who study ancient bronzes have a huge databases of compositions, and we're trying to figure out if we can identify workshops or find out where the raw material came from. You know, we're looking at trace elements. It's a complicated situation. But um, I, I will I will sweep in another question. We did test for, for all the conservation nerds, we did test for chlorides, um, which is basically something like table salt, but in solution in the soil, which can really form aggressive corrosion and eat away at the copper alloy. We did not find chlorides or bronze disease, as this process is called. Um, but uh, through the help of a, of, a, of a dear colleague, Terry Weiser, we discussed the surface of this bronze because I was puzzled um, by the light green color. And we think there is a tin enrichment on the surface, which creates these pustules and very soft, almost chalky surface. Um, I'll hand it over to Jens to dig up another <laughs> question to answer. Yes, I, I found one here that that asks about um, why such care was used to craft a beautiful horse in a costly medium. And what aside from decoration was the role of horses? So that's actually a very good, a good question. We see horses are very common occurrence in ancient, particularly Greek um, iconography. Uh, we are in this time, what we call the archaic time, the classical, um, and then that is the, the period preceding the classical. So, so say roughly um, from the seventh century through the fifth centuries BC, and the um, and horses were actually also um, an important part of status um, in archaic society. There was sort of what we could call sort of an aristocracy um, of people who were able to afford 
um, to 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 have horses, care for horses, um, maybe you know breed them, and um, and there was a whole um, sort of like being represented with a with a horse that you show how well it has been taken care of and how well you you groom it was sort of like a a, a way of of a, it was a way of you could say conspicuous consumption but it was a way to show off your status um and you see that there's a horse like this with this very you know neatly clipped mane with the braided uh, tail and with its overall like you know spectacular um, um shape uh, that that was one such one such horse um, so for the for the for, for the aristocracy, um, that was part of their you could say like it was part of their lifestyle, um, and so being represented this way. Also, then for for the figure itself, you will ask the question first: We thought, is it an athlete or is it you know who is this? Is it just is it a hunter? Is it what is it? But there's like looks like a military setup. You know, it's like um, um, it has like a very light um, this kind of dress could be could be part of like a a, a kind of a soft form of body armor, a, a, a kind of a leather, maybe, um, you know, with, with, with light weapons for the cavalry um, and, uh, and, and to be able to, to join the cavalry, you had to be of means because you kind of basically, you bring your own horse kind of cavalry. Jens, um, let me yes. add another question because that connects directly what you're talking about. Um, one one viewer says you seem convinced that the writer is male and what makes you think this because um this person thinks um the initial reaction was that it mm -hmm. is a female and i i just have to tell you you know that i mean we could find out that the horse is male because it is quite well articulated on the underside of its belly but as i cleaned away the soil and around the fringe of of the garment um we do not see if we do not see genitals. We do not know if this is um, a male or a female based on what's hidden under the skirt. Just to bring up that the rider of the Boston horse was nude and it that was a male. But what are your thoughts about male or female? No, we we did actually early in the process consider um, that this was uh, that this was a a female figure, um, and um, we. Um, one option, for instance, would be like an Amazon, right? Sort of known as fierce riders, um, mythical uh, woman warriors, and um, but we we um, um, and then yeah, sort of that cocktail dress, as we like to call it, <laughs> um, is not in in a sense, you know, sort of like uh, I mean, it's not something that we that we find exclusively. Uh, on, 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 on females or on males. The kind of weapon with the sword and then sort of maybe a spear sort of like it made this, it put this more like in a military context. And if it was, and if it could be, you know, understood, you know, to fit in that military context, we can exclude uh, a female being represented. And we don't have among the relatively few uh, examples of, of, of horses with riders, um, in this, in for this type of object, I do not think we have any female riders. So mm -hmm. the hair is also interesting. We looked at, assuming it's complete uh, in the way it is. Um, it's a short hair. I showed earlier the the single rider who has lost his horse. Um, the Getty collection has sort of this long, sort of more luxurious hair, which is actually typical for, for archaic sort of young men. Uh, uh, so, so that wouldn't have been even like sort of like a typical giveaway. Um, for the time being, we operating under the assumption, yes, that it is a male rider. I have a few nuts and bolts questions um, that I'll lump in together um, regarding um, time. Um, I the process of cleaning took me about, I would say, um, five to six months from beginning to end, but it was not um, every full day. I, I, I went I went in growth spurts. I'm, I'm not sure how many hours I put in, Jens, maybe, maybe it was 10 full weeks of work if one tries to 
add up all the hours. And then many people there, I think we have a whole bunch of conservators and technical um, attendees. I, I did apply a dilute um, acrylic um, resin coating to strengthen the surface and it is paraloid B72. It is. Uh, it was very dilute, it's, it's easily reversible, but the surface is really in some areas chalky and can easily could be abraded by handling. So I, I felt like I, I had to strengthen it a little bit. Um, Jens, do you want to take a stab at another question? Yeah, there are so many. I can't possibly, you know, it's so, answer, yes, wonderful answer questions. everyone. Um, let me see. Ah, so I was designer. I, I just want to just I quickly um, toss over to you like about whether you used only the scalpel for the cleaning that you showed in the video or other means. I, I used other scalpels too. The, these eye scalpels, they're so tiny and pointy. They really worked well at breaking up the soil. Um, I used larger sur surgical scalpels later on to, to create a more uh, smooth surface where I had to shave down, you know, irregular corrosion products. And then often I also use tiny little bamboo sticks or or, or different brushes. I, I did not use water or any any chemicals at all. And um, here's a question about the presence of a possible presence of a saddle um, or, a, or a pad. Um, we didn't see any, uh, you know, like blanket or, 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 or saddle, any signs of that under the, um, under the figure of the rider, right, Susanna? No, no, not at all. I think in some photos it may look like there's something, but it's, I think it's a shadow from the photograph. It could um, be. No, it's 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 really it. The 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 leg touches the horse's body directly, and there's nothing under that little fringe which lays so gently on the back of the horse. Yeah, here another question about you know could the cupped hand be holding the reins of the missing bridle? Um, I think we addressed this a little bit earlier. I think that's a that's probably the best possibility for the rider's left hand. Um, uh, so so it's interesting because if you look at the horse, um, some people who really know a thing about horsemanship um, uh, have actually determined that while the, the rider is relatively dynamic um, in his or you know her position, uh, it's um, the horse is, is, is rather static. This is almost like sort of it comes to a halt, like sort of like we stretched out uh, uh, front legs and it somewhat, somewhat tucked in chin, sort of like the, like the rider made the, the horse to stop somehow. So it's not, it's not sort of like a kind of a galloping <laughs> a scene that we have here. Um, where I found this under the very first question in the Q&A, the, the longer ones about how you balance the fear of causing damage with the need to clean and uncover information. Have there been new technologies revolutionized the way conservators manage fear? Did you have fear? I had a lot of fear because um, there was so much, uh, the, the soil was so hard, so densely connected to the soft corroded underlying surface. And I think, um, the only way you can manage the fear is through, first of all, a lot of experience. You have, you know, I've, I've cleaned many bronzes before, so I know a little bit how surface behave. And and that's, you know, you have a lot of respect for the material and you, be, you begin very slowly. You know, you really, you have to get a feel for the hardness of the surface, how quickly uh, materials like to separate from you know how quickly can you or how can you separate the soil from the underlying and embedded corrosion um i think the the magnification helps certainly you know really excellent imaging techniques and microscopes um by the way someone asked about the magnification of that microscope um oh it it, it has a huge range of of magnification um, I used actually kind of low magnification, I think um, times 20 or 40, because um, the microscope was almost too powerful for this piece. <laughs> and it's very hard to get um, a depth of focus if, if you go on to very high magnification. 
I think I'm afraid we have um, reached the end of our allotted time, time for Q&A. Um, there are still many wonderful questions. I, I, I really have to thank everybody for following us and, and being so thoughtful and participating. Um, um, well, thank you, Jens, for um, thank you. having this live discussion of this really extraordinary project. Um, thank you, viewers from all over the world for watching, um, for being so engaged and submitting questions. Um, Sorry here, if you didn't get to address all of your questions. Yes. Um, you know, there's also a way of contacting us if there are burning questions. Um, here is a view of the Getty website, the exhibition Get site, website at getty.edu for further information on future programs. And there are some resources as well. There's a video available that we have in the exhibition, which talks about the project, which involve, includes um, some of our archaeological partners from Germany and um, Albania. The piece is on view until next year, January 29th. Um, so it's time to say goodbye. Thank you again. And uh, we will be happy to welcome you here at the villa. Thank you, Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>